a quick new idea daily from the world's greatest TEDx talks. I'm your host, Atosa Leone, and this is TEDx Shorts. While science still does not understand the human brain to the extent needed to cure diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, believe it or not, we also don't fully understand the brain of a simple worm. Stephen Larson, a neuroscientist, entrepreneur, and founder of the Open Worm Project, believes that if we cannot build a computer model of a worm, the most studied organism in all of biology, then we don't stand a chance to understand something as complex as the human brain. Today, Stephen shares why studying the common round worm is important and how his open science project that aims to digitally reconstruct an entire organism might just help us unlock the hidden secrets of our brain. Watson and Crick, two geneticists, discovered the double helix structure uh, of DNA and won the Nobel Prize for this. Um, but the lure of understanding how our brain work was too much for one of them, Francis Crick, and he actually shifted from genetics into the field of neuroscience. And he came to the Salk Institute in San Diego, California, where I'm visiting you from today. And he started to look at the vast body of work in neuroscientists in neuroscience to try to understand how the brain worked. And in 1994, he published something that he called the Astonishing Hypothesis, which was this. It was, a person's mental activities are entirely due to the behavior of nerve cells, glial cells, which are also in the brain, and the atoms, ions, and molecules that make them up and influence them. Now, he wasn't the first neuroscientist to think this, but I like the way that he put it together. I was curious about how technology, the wonderful technology that we have today, might help us understand this a bit further. If in fact, our entire mental activities are really due to cells, then that tells us that it pushes the question back, which is how do these cells actually work? And could technology help us understand that? So I'm going to do an experiment on you today. I'm going to perform some surgery. Okay, don't worry. It won't hurt. I know we just met, but I'm a doctor. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to open up your skull. Okay. And we're going to take one of your neurons in your brain. And we're going to replace that neuron with computer code that does exactly the same thing that that neuron does. Now, I'm going to ask you two questions. The first question is, have I changed your identity? Are you a different person because I have taken one of your neurons out and I've replaced it with some, some computer code? You might say, well, Stephen, I have like trillions of neurons. If you do this with just one neuron, I probably wouldn't feel the difference. OK, maybe. Second question, would I have learned something about your brain? Well, maybe I could, you know, take you, put you in front of a movie. I'd see what you were thinking at uh, TEDx, but I'd only have one neuron to look at, so maybe I wouldn't have that much information. Okay, let's take this one step further. What if we replaced a second neuron, a third neuron, a fourth neuron? What if we replaced a third of your neurons, all with computer code, again, doing exactly what these cells did? Okay, what if I went and I just replaced your whole brain, okay? <laughs> all of the nerve cells in your brain with computer code that did exactly the same thing that your neurons did. Well, let's ask these questions again. Have I changed who you are? Ooh, well, <laughs> uh, we have to really believe in our hypothesis uh, if we're going to accept this. But if it's true, uh, if I just take every single cell and I turn into computer code, you'd be the same person. But now you'd be uploaded in the computer. Well, this is still a lot of speculation. But let's look at the second question. What would I have learned? Would I have been able to learn something more than what I know today? And the answer is probably we'd learn a lot. If we could see everything that you were thinking at every moment, we'd be able to see it all in a computer. We'd be able to learn so much about how our brains work and maybe be able to see if this hypothesis is true. Well, uh, this experiment can't be done today, and I don't know how many of you would volunteer to sign up for this particular experiment. Frankly, our technology today just doesn't let us do this. But interestingly, our story progresses to 2010, when a friend of mine made a pretty crazy announcement on Twitter. He said, my New Year's resolution is that I'm going to simulate the brain of an entire organism that only has 300 neurons in it. And I saw this and I thought, wow, this is actually brilliant. This would be a first step towards exactly that kind of thought experiment. If you could take an animal and it only has 300 neurons, well, that shouldn't be too hard. And you need to do that anyway if you were going to get to the step of understanding our brains a little bit better, right? 
But then there was this thing. He said C. elegans. It was like, I'm going to do the brain of C. elegans. And I had heard of that, but I didn't exactly know what it was. I found out that this animal actually is pretty interesting, right? It actually does all the things that you'd expect an animal can do with only 300 neurons. It manages to, you know, have sensation. It goes, it looks uh, for mates. It finds food. It finds itself in a really complicated microscopic world. It turns out that over the years, this animal was the first animal that we mapped its entire genome. It's one of the first animals where we know how it grows up from one single cell up to the thousand cells that it has. We know every single cell division. And those neurons that I told you about, the 302 neurons, well, guess what? This animal, of all animals that we know about on the planet, we've mapped it out to the nth degree. We've given names to all the neurons. We know where they are and what positions they lie in in the body. So armed with this information, uh, my friends and I decided to start a project that we called OpenWorm, which is a project to build the world's first digital organism in a computer, specifically C. elegans, a microscopic worm with only a thousand cells in its whole body. Now, it turns out that we were armed with the fact that technology and software has been getting so good that we can deal with really complicated devices. And we realized, is it possible that what we're proposing is to build the world's first worm matrix? an environment where a nervous system would not know if it was in the real world or if it was in a virtual world. But seriously, we wanted to understand how, like in that thought experiment, if we put all those neurons inside of a computer and we watched how that worm crawled, how it did what it did, could we unpack something deeper? Could we unpack a mathematical principle that helped us understand how neurons work in general, something that we could apply back to the human being? We realized that we were doing all this in software. We had an opportunity unlike any other, which is that we could not just do this amongst ourselves, because this is a really challenging thing to do, even with 302 neurons. We could invite the world, anyone with a computer and an internet connection, to join us in our virtual lab to help us build this digital simulation together. And we turned to technologies like GitHub, where we could share every line of computer code that we were writing up online so, we, so everybody in the world can see how we build this as we build it, line by line. And we interacted and reached out with folks on social media. And we put all our meetings up online through Google Hangouts up on YouTube. And we had scientific discussions that the whole world could see. And as a consequence, the community that's built up around OpenWorm has been the most exciting thing about the project to date, with collaborations from major universities to help from companies like Amazon and Google. Um, we've built a, a community of folks that are really no different from you. Uh, anybody with the curiosity to wonder how do our brains work have been our community members, from students to non-students, from coders to non-coders, biologists to non-biologists, trying to understand how this little worm works. This is not a Pixar animation. This is a simulation with real physics behind it. And you can actually fire up in your computer and start to see how it works and start to see it come to life. <laughs> So it turned out that maybe our worm matrix was possible. So what we've done is we've gone from the curiosity that we all share about how your brains work to a Nobel Prize winning worm. And we've explored the possibility that maybe building a worm matrix might not be the craziest way to try and make progress in understanding how our own minds work. But what's really been the most exciting thing about this is the community that's formed. And I'm really just one representative of really the efforts of hundreds of people who share that same curiosity and have picked up a virtual shovel and found a way to join in this effort. So I invite you to join us as well. The TEDx talk you just listened to was recorded at a TEDx event in Bangalore, India. All TEDx events are independently organized by volunteers who believe in TED's mission of ideas worth spreading. Special thanks to the organizing team at TEDx Bangalore. Visit TED.com slash TEDx Shorts to listen to the full talk and learn more about TEDx Shorts. I'm Atosa Leone. Thanks for listening and see you tomorrow.